Well, good evening, everybody. Um, today is October 1st, 2024, the start of the fourth quarter here for us of 2024. Um, for those of you who don't recognize my voice, uh, this is Ryan Herbert. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. One thing to note, um, if you have any questions, you can feel, please feel free to enter them in the, um, the question area. I'll try to um, get to them as I go along. Sometimes I don't actually see them until I've kind of moved past the slide that we're talking about. Um, but if there's anything that you, you have questions about that um, I don't address, uh, you know, please feel free to shoot me an email or give me a, a call in the office tomorrow. Um, so we will go ahead and get started here. Now, this is our team. Uh, I'm sure everyone has seen on Facebook. We have added um, a, a bunch of new faces um, over the last couple months. Uh, the newest hires that we have would be um, Brandon here and Parker right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. And then we have Basil, who was with us a uh, number of years ago, he he left and then decided to come back. Um, and then all the way over here on the right, kind of by Brian and Andrew, we have Eric. Eric is um, going to be taking over for Lawrence in our, our para planner role. So the person who puts together all of our financial plans as Lawrence is now stepping fully into the financial advising role. So uh, Eric, um, he will be working out of our Orlando office. Um, so, you know, I just want to give everybody a, a, an update on the staff. You know, if you if you, you call the office and you end up speaking with Brandon or Parker or Faisal, um, and, and even Sam, Sam's pretty new, fairly new with us as well, or, or Eric, you know, you end up speaking to anyone, then that's just, you know, putting a face to the name. But, you know, Dominic does a really good job of, of putting the information out there on Facebook, kind of sharing some information about um, the staff, you know, giving fun updates there. So if you don't follow us on Facebook, please go ahead. Um, on Facebook and, and follow us there and they get all kinds of updates as well. Um, you know, obviously everybody knows Mike, everybody knows myself. Um, this is me prior to COVID, prior before I had my beard. I guess I should probably update these photos for, for Mike and myself as well here. But you know, for tonight, this is um, informational purposes only, not intended to represent any um, direct investment, any direct investment advice. You know, if you have any questions about what I'm talking about here, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me and, you know, we can certainly have a, a further conversation because this, this conversation is just kind of be, you know, high level, really what Mike, myself, and the, the, the team at ProStatus, what we're thinking when we're looking at the markets, when we're looking at the portfolios, and we're coming up with the um, financial plans. Obviously, you know, one of the big things, I've been talking about this for, for a while, um, at the end of 2025, December 31st, 2025, the current tax rates that we have under the um, Tax Cut and Jobs Act um, that Trump put into place, um, they will be going away here. And, you know, really the, the, the biggest thing that we can see is as a, a married filing couple, um, you can see over here right now, um, we have a 10% tax bracket, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, and the very top bracket being 37%. As soon as we cross over into 2026, that 12% bracket goes away. It switches over to 15. The income limitation changes for it as well. The 22 goes up to 25. The 24% uh, bracket jumps up to 28. And the amount of income that fits in that actual bracket does shrink down because before it went from about 165,000 up to 315,000. Now, you know, it's about $80,000 less that fits into that bracket, um, going from 150 to 233. Then our 32% bracket drops to 30, I mean, goes up to 33%. The 35% bracket remains the same. However, once again, the amount of income that fits in that bracket currently is about $200,000. As soon as we switch over um, back to the pre-2018 brackets, we go from having $200,000 fitting in that 35% bracket to having about you know, less than $60,000 fitting in there. 
Um, and then our top bracket, instead of starting at 600,000 and being 37%, it starts at 470,000 and goes to the 39.6%. So, you know, Roth conversions, um, still a, a, you know, we are kind of up against the, the deadline here. We've got a, two months, ideally two months left to perform any Roth conversions for the year. You know, I, I, and speaking with m my clients directly, this really is the time of year of which we're going to be doing the, the Roth conversions, trying to get them all done this month, um, being October, trying to get them all done in October. That way we can make our estimated payments and, and, and be done for the year. Um, and then same thing next year. We want to make sure we get those Roth conversions done. Um, if we're not having those conversations, please, you know, feel free to reach out to myself or Catherine or Mike or Andrew or Lawrence or, or um, you know, any of our any of our advisors, any one of our staff, and we will gladly continue those conversations and kind of pick them up. Um, also, you know, one of the big things is right now the uh, there's an estate planning concern. You know, uh, the 11.2 million dollar um, exemption. You know, it's it's inflation adjusted at like 13.6, so you can give away. 13.6 million dollars over your lifetime right now after 2025 it, it's going to drop down to five million dollars and it's going to be inflation adjusted again so it'll probably be somewhere around 7.2 7.3 million dollars of of what you can give away but you know we can take time now if you have a net worth of over four hundred thousand dollars between your investment property um money you have in the bank account if you have a net worth of over five hundred thousand dollars, we should be revisiting your estate plan. Please, please, please reach out to to us, and um, you know we'll have that conversation because we can take advantage of some of that larger lifetime exemption of about thirteen point six now um, before anything changes. You know, nothing worse than us doing everything we can to try to reduce taxes while you're alive, only to have the government take 30 to 40% right off the top when you pass away from the kids. No one wants to pay taxes while you're alive, and you certainly don't want the kids to have to pay extra taxes when you pass away. Um, you know, really, this is, you know, my, my thought, Mike and I's thoughts on overall the, uh, the equity markets, um, and the fixed income markets. Um, one question there is, do I mean 4 million or 5 million? You know, I, I mean, you know, when I go back here and I say, you know, if you have a net worth of over $4 million, we're going to revisit the estate plan if, if you're clients of us when we come in. Um, simply because, you know, while right now, when it drops to 7.3, certainly at $4 million, you don't have an estate tax problem right now. As things grow over time, you will get closer and closer to that number. So really, you know, if you have a net worth of over $4 million, we should have the conversation of maybe it's time to start doing some very specific estate planning um, to take advantage of the rules now and then the rules when they change in the future. Um, so, you know, reach out. You know, we will be having that conversation. Um, at our next meeting to be sh sure. Um, you know, last time I, I did this presentation, um, kind of the growing concern is that we're going to have market volatility kind of heading into the fall. Um, at the end of September, just at the end of September, we had a debt ceiling issue. Um, and so the, the conversation that was ongoing between um, our advisors, myself, Mike, Catherine, Lawrence, and, and, and clients is, you know, we have this debt ceiling issue. We have several members of Congress that have said that they're not going to vote um, unless they get their way and, you know, they're willing to shut the government down. Well, you know, what did the government do? They passed a debt ceiling deal. It kind of really flew under the radar because it is an election year and everything's really focused on the election and, and what, what Trump is saying versus what Kamala is saying. It really kind of flew under the radar there. but you know, they passed um, a short-term funding deal, and, and they really just kicked the can down the road. They didn't solve anything. They just said, yeah, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll increase the spending limits. We can keep the government open, and, you know, we'll deal with it in, you know, another couple of months. So, you know, they didn't really fix any of the problems that we had. Um, we had talked about becoming much, much more conservative um, as we got closer to 
the end of September. That was kind of the ongoing conversation. We're going to start dialing back the aggressiveness in the portfolios. We're going to start moving some money over to um, fixed income and, and cash alternatives. But you know, as we got closer to that deadline, a lot of the talk, a lot of the news coming out was you know, they're really close on a deal. They've taken some things out of the equation. Um, so we really uh, decided that ultimately we didn't have to, to pull the trigger right then before the before the, the debt ceiling deadline. Um, but you know, it still is something that we are still monitoring given all of the volatility that we are going to start seeing now creeping up because we are um, about 34 days, I want to say, about 34 days away from the election. I'll show you a chart here that kind of really shows what I mean about kind of continued volatility a little bit later on in this uh, presentation. But, you know, really the, the, the big news um, was that we were really waiting to see what the Federal Reserve did, was going to do um, with their rate cuts. You know, a lot of people really want to see um, aggressive Fed rate cutting, you know, really starting to, to drive that high interest rate down, to start bringing interest mortgage rates down, kind of spur spending. Um, but, you know, really should be careful in, in, in what we wish for. What this, ch what this chart is showing us is, the S&P 500 and its performance um, after the first rate cut, depending on how fast or how slow they go. So right here, we can see zero. This is the timing of the first rate cut, one month, two months, three months, four months post the rate cut. And you know, really what we see here is that in the, in the very first year, you know, the stock market does tend to do better when we have slow and steady rate cuts. There really has been, you know, a, a distinct difference in how the stock market performs, you know, using the S&P 500 as a reference here, um, you know, in all different types of, of rate cutting cycles. And this goes back um, to the, you know, the, the post-World War II uh, period of, of rate cutting and, you know, dividing it you know, fast rate cuts where we're talking about at least five rate cuts in a year. Slow rate cuts would be less than, than um, five cuts in a year. And then the, the non-cycles, so our fast cycles, that's this yellow line here. Um, this is more than five, five cuts in a year. Our slow cycle, this is our blue line. This is less than five. Um, and then non cycles that's this green line here this is one rate cut in the year and really what this is showing us is after the first rate cut you know all of the markets for those first couple months whether we're going slow or fast for that time frame um you know they all kind of performed about the same for the first couple of months it's really kind of later on how many months after the, the rate cuts start ha happening that we start to see this divergence in what's going on in the market um you know really what this is showing is the the slow cycles have been much more re rewarding if the fed is going to start cutting aggressively you know they're really going to start bringing that rate down it really means that they're really trying to combat you know uh, an ongoing recession a pending recession or some type of um financial crisis to really what they were trying to do is bring inflation down inside their core measurement and that's really where they have inflation it's heading the right way but what we can see here is it, this is a little bit hard to see you know the first year of you know in the very first year where we have rate cuts where we have less than five the percentage change in the market from that that first rate cut has been about 24 percent increase in the overall market when they cut rates really, really rapidly, um, at least five times in the year, the S&P 500, that same time percentage, has only performed about 5% for the year. And then right down here, you know, non-cycles where we have just one rate cut in the year, the S&P 500 really didn't do anything. So for those of you that are, that are hoping that the rates are going to come down really drastically so we can do refinances um, or home equity loans or something like that, you know, you really have to be careful what you wish for because those fast rate cuts bringing that rate down will be at the expense of 
the overall market. While yes, having a, a higher interest rate is uncomfortable, you know, you certainly do feel better having the stock market growing, having your portfolio growing at you know a much more exponential rate than if we had that mortgage interest rate come down and the, the, the prime rate come down from there. Um, you know, one thing that, that we invest in inside of the portfolio is as a sleeve of the portfolio. Obviously, there's a lot of broad market, um, some international exposure, but sectors. The, the, the sector trends also really, you know, kind of dictate or the, the, the speed at which um, the Federal Reserve cuts their interest rates really does have an impact on the overall, excuse me, the overall sector. So, you know, slow cutting cycles where, you know, we're talking once again, slow cutting cycles, that's this black line here, really has shown that the economically sensitive or the, or the cyclical sectors of the S&P 500, meaning energy, materials, industrials, consumer discretionary spending, financials, and, and IT, um, have performed better when we have those slow moving cycles. You know, and this is really kind of comparing itself to our defensive sectors, which are your consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, um, and, you know, telecommunication sectors, but, you know, those cyclical sectors, which is kind of where we are focusing some of the portfolio right now, do much better under a slower rate. You can see gain during the first year, those cycles, as long as we have a slow rate, gain about 4.3% year over year compared to if the, the, the Fed cuts rates really rapidly, does not bode well for those sectors there. So, you know, we're, this is one thing that we're monitoring, how fast the Federal Reserve starts lowering interest rates is going to have an impact on how the portfolio, the overall portfolio is allocated for everybody. It's how much money we're dedicating into broad market versus defensive positions versus um, cyclical areas of the market. It all really does have an impact. It's not just about interest rates and the price of bonds, it does have an overall impact on the equity side as well. Um, you know, the, the bond market itself really has um, been pricing in the fact that, you know, speaking of bonds, the, the fact that they the bond market thinks that the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates um, very quickly, kind of taking an express lane, if you would, to much lower interest rates. You know, we're seeing the price of bonds really start to rise up based on this this half a percent move you know it, 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 unless we are really facing a recession which you know I, I don't think that we are given where manufacturing is given where interest rates are given where um cpe is i don't think that we're truly headed in in a recession you know uh, barring that we really expect the Fed to, to maintain this slow and steady pace. You know, in, in the last six months, the conditions really have developed to allow the Fed to have this slow and steady pace to easing its monetary policy. Inflation has has cooled off. Um, the labor market, the jobs reports, everything is is kind of where we want it. This really does satisfy what the Fed is is looking at to maintain it's uh it's price it's pricing in with the the interest rates what we see here this is cpe you know we can see where inflation kind of peaked right around mid-july you know this is showing a seven percent change year over year um our core you know if you hear the banging above me i'm apologizing i can hear my my kids with the puppy kind of chasing her around right now but you know, really what we're seeing here is the, the, the inflation metric that really the, the Fed looks at when it's setting its policy um, is personal consumer expenditures, that's um, PCE, um, excluding food and energy prices, which that's the core PCE, um, really has fallen by half. Right now, we are down to a rate of right around 2.5, 2.6, which that's really where 
the Fed wants inflation to be. Unless inflation starts to tick up really rapidly, I don't anticipate them cutting the rate any quicker. Really, manufacturing, this is one thing that I mentioned here, manufacturing is pretty much right where they, they want things to be. While yes, um, it didn't change from, uh, uh, manufacturing PMI did not change from uh, August into September, the, the rate stayed the same. You know, kind of, Realistically speaking, it's, it's a contracting movement because it didn't go anywhere. But anytime we have a factor of over 40, that means that the economy is expanding when it comes to manufacturing. So we do have some areas of, of, of those, those aspects where we are um, contracting, but overall, when we look at all the um, indicators, all of the metrics that go into the manufacturing PMI, you know, we kind of come down here, the overall economy is showing positive signs where, you know, we're at 53, once again, as long as we are above 40, that means the economy is growing. So this leads us to say that the Federal Reserve is going to maintain a slow and steady pace with cutting rates. Unless we start to see the economy, you know, this rate, the manufacturing really starts to drop off. The overall um, econ economic indicators that come out of manufacturing, unless those really start to fall off, then the Federal Reserve will maintain that slow pace. There's no really reason for them to go very, very rapidly. You know, really, the the Federal Reserve, you know, what we've seen here, you know, once again, this is showing us um, fixed income after rate cuts, how rapidly we see a return on fixed income. You know, most central banks and treasury yields are, are, are still way above um, the inflation rate. We are seeing really, you know, the price of bonds really start to shoot up um, depending on how well or how poorly, uh, uh, you know, they, or I'm sorry, how fast or slow the overall rate cut moves here. You know, most recently, um, 2001, they did more than five cuts in a year. The total six month return that we saw on um, the U.S. bond, the U.S. aggregate bond index or AGG, if you want to look at the S&P 500, was about 4.23 percent um, that it saw six months after the rate cut, um, 7.5 percent 12 months after. You know, so rapid rates in in cutting the interest rate really will show us really rapid rises in bond prices and give us much better returns. You know, the slow rates you know, some years has been good, some years has been bad, but really a slow and steady rate is really what is going to favor the overall economy. So you really just have to um, you know, taper your expectations on what we're going to see out of fixed income. Just because they, they cut it a half a point does not mean all of a sudden we're going to see really drastic rises in bond prices. You might see some in the short term, but it could really kind of tend to fall off. You know, one of the things a, a lot of clients have been asking me is, you know, what are our thoughts on the election and, and you know what I really try to focus on is when we're looking at the election you know most people want to know what the the stock market's going to do historically speaking whenever and this is the the S&P 500 return um, as a percentage the year prior leading up to one month after this is really kind of what we're going to focus on here is one month to three months to six months after how the s p 500 does how the stock markets do at the election normally whenever we have an incumbent win it really just the stock market really just views it as four more years of the exact same thing so what we normally see with the overall markets is there's not a whole lot of reaction in the market when the incumbent wins you know it sees a nice a little bit of a run-up the month after just because you know there's a little bit of euphoria and then the stock market really just doesn't change that much over that time period one month after the, it's up about 14 percent 12 then it's then it goes to 12 then it's 13 then 12.8 then 15.1 so not a lot of change historically speaking 
whenever we have a change in party, and it does not matter if we go from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat, we see a nice run up in the stock market those first three to four months after the election. It happened when we went from Bush to Obama. It happened when we went from Obama to Trump. It happened when we went from Trump to Biden. And that's kind of what we see here. One month after the election, we see a really big difference in where the stock market has been. And then as soon as we get three months into it, January, February, the stock market really kind of tends to roll over and die. But overall, it does start to tend to perform well once we have a change in party because the stock market is viewing it as something is different. We are having change in policy. It does still depend on what is going to happen in the House and the Senate because you know it's still going to be political gridlock. They are still going to argue over everything. They're still going to try to kick the can down the road. So it's not like one party is going to win and then they're just or, you know the one party is going to win the White House and they're going to force all this legislation through. There will be political gridlock. There will be a lot of back and forth. Or you know the term I heard today was political football. Um, where both sides are having their, their plan for offense and they have their plan for defense from that perspective. But you know, really what we are looking at right now, I had talked about with, with clients, we talked about with clients the, the, the need for some sort of protection for the increased volatility that is going to be happening. And what I'm seeing right now is, like I said, we're about 34 days out from the election. That puts us right here on this chart this is the election day this bar in the middle here and so right now is right around the point where this is the, the vix the volatility index this is showing all of the elections 92 96 2000 2004 08 12 and 16. the most recent elections what has happened as far as volatility in the market and oops sorry did not mean to do that um right around day 33 34 is when we start to see volatility really, really peak up. You know, the long-term average on, on volatility is right around 19. Right around 19 is kind of normally where we see this, this VIX indicator. Um, anytime we get above 25 in a non-election cycle like this, that's really when we start to kind of panic, or well, not panic, it's really when we start to get concerned about what's going on in the market. So we are expecting there to be continued volatility leading up to the election. As soon as the election happens, you know, we'll have a couple days where there's not a lot of volatility, but then we still will see some peaks before it eventually falls off once we get 100 days into whomever the next president happens to be at this point. So, you know, one of the things that you might see in the portfolios is once again, that shift to safety. Whether we are moving, you know, traditionally over the past several years, Mike and I have not been a huge proponent of bonds because we knew these interest rate hikes were coming. As the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, the prices of bonds fall. Now that we are in this falling interest rate environment, bonds are becoming a little bit more attractive. As they start to lower interest rates, the prices of bonds rise. Although if they take the slow and steady rate cut, they're not going to rise very drastically. So that being said, one alternative that we are looking at are called structured notes. We have structured notes as part of some of the portfolios at this current time, but you know, the, the most basic way to describe these structured notes, and you know, we do them once a month, um, and the pricing that we get on them does kind of change, but, but in general, what they say are, let's look at the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, and the NASDAQ. Let's look at it on a one-year, or 13 month period. We'll look at it today, October 1st, 2024. Let's look at it a year from now, October 1st, 2025. If the worst performing out of those three indexes, being the S&P, the Dow, and the NASDAQ, if the worst performing of them is positive, if it's positive anything, I don't care if it's positive 1% or 10%, if the worst performing of those three indexes is positive, you know, the most recent one that we did said that it credits 8% interest. So if the worst performing index is positive at all, you get 8% on the money. If the stock market, if the worst performing of them is negative, well, then nothing happens. You don't get anything, but you don't lose anything. So it's a way for us to have short-term protection on the downside 
and get us a little bit more upside than we would have in a traditional bond where we might be making four or five percent. So this will be part of the conversation that we have going forward between now and election time. We are still monitoring the portfolios. We're still keeping eye out an eye out on the portfolio. And if you start to see kind of broad sweeping changes in the portfolio where we're shifting out of a good bit of the equity and moving into something that's much more defensive, it's because we are seeing the volatility tick up to a really high level. We want to have some protectionary measures in place. <clears throat> you know, we're watching it. Um, you know, really Roth conversions, you know, to, to summarize everything I said, Roth conversions, we really want to, to have those conversations, continue those conversations to make sure um, that it's a good idea for you or, or explain why it's not a good idea. You know, we got through the debt ceiling. All they did was take the can down the road, but we are still concerned about the election. All the worries are not over just because we're through the debt ceiling, but continued volatility is really what we're looking at. While the Federal Reserve has lowered its, lowered its interest rate, I anticipate them to take a slow and steady approach to cutting that interest rate, You know, simply because as long as inflation stays where the Fed wants it, they're not gonna change their approach. As long as unemployment stays where the Fed wants it, they're not going to change their approach. And that is pretty much everything that I have to talk to you guys about tonight. You know, if you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call in the office, 410-863-1040, or, you know, you can email me, ryan at prostatusfg. Um, I'm in the office for the rest of this week, and then next week I will be out of the office. This is the one of the two weeks of the year where I have to take off work and go work for my wife, where she really, truly is my boss for an entire week. I have to listen to everything that she says, um, but it's one of her big events. So, you know, if you have any questions, please, 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 feel free to reach out to, you know, myself, Mike, Catherine, Andrew, you know, anybody at the office. Um, we have a, a, a bunch of events coming up. I know we have a, a Wine and Wisdom event coming up uh, later this month where, you know, it's, it's a bring a friend event. You know, it's an opportunity for you to bring some of your friends into the office to, to meet the staff, to meet Mike and myself. You get to have some of Mike's really good wine. Mike is an amazing cook. He does cook um, the meals right there in the office. It is a very intimate event. Um, I want to say he keeps it to right around 12 people, um, but be on the lookout. We have a lot of fun events coming up, um, end of October, into November, and then once again, and you know, we don't really do much in, in December because everyone is busy with Christmas and families and everything, um, but we pick everything right back up in January. So thank you everybody for attending. I hope everybody has um, got some information out of this, and like I said, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out, but I hope everybody has a, a wonderful night and a great rest of the week. Thank you so much.